<laughs> what I'm really going to talk about is why bother with all this RDF and Sparkle stuff. Uh, a little bit more the, the economics than the science behind it. And the reason I want to talk about why RDF is because it's not always obvious that you should use one technology for another technology. But if you look at what the goals of our institute are, it's to provide data to you, other scientists, so that you can do your science. That's why the NEH and the Swiss government funds us. It's not for us to sit on our data and not make it available. So in the Swiss Bud Group and in Swiss Lipids and RIA and all the other databases that we provide, we provide them as RDF so that you can use them. And if we also provide them in other formats, again, so that you can use them. It's very different than Google or Facebook who are very interested in keeping their data for it, that they can use it, not you can use it. <coughs> we also do a lot of annotation of disease variants for humans. So there's a nice paper by my colleague, Livia, where she discusses and describes how we annotate known variants with disease-related behaviors in humans. But why Sparkle? Why RDF? Well, it's very simple. If you look at what a small wet lab laboratory cannot afford, is they cannot afford to host their, all the data in the life sciences in-house. They cannot make their own data warehouses. Even if it's technically straightforward to do it, you just cannot have that many databases because they cost a lot of money to run. But at the same time, we also have the problem that if you don't have access to all that data, they can't, not using all that data, they're basically redoing a lot of science that has already been done. You're losing information, losing knowledge, and just doing things again and again. Another thing that we want to do in our group is to focus on the right kind of optimization. And that is a nice exadata machine, full rack, and that's a very expensive machine. But that doesn't really compute to what it costs to run a small wet lab year after year. Biological reagents are extremely expensive in comparison to hardware. Hardware also gets much, much faster for each price every single year. Labs do still do Western blots. That hasn't changed that much in the last 30 years. Why provide this for the public to use? Why don't we use something else? I mean, we've had SQL for 30 years, well, a lot more than 30 years now. It can be provided on the web, and our community does it. We have WormBase and UCSC, which have uh, access to their database over the web. Unfortunately, it's not very practical. You can't federate between these databases. And while the ISO standard for SQL is a very nice bookshelf wide, in a very pragmatic example of these two databases, you can't actually ask the same kind of queries. You can't even do the metadata queries. Because one is Postgres and the other one is MySQL. So it shows tables or slash T to get the data. Local SQL is very expensive for people to run. And that doesn't really change if you make it a NoSQL store. XML is now better than JSON. Protobufers doesn't really change. It's all quite expensive. And especially you see that very well if you look at how we do data integration in the traditional science, in the bioinformatics. You go out there, you take a look at the FTP site, and you download some data. And that is in some custom format, custom serialization. Might be JSON, might be XML, might be very nicely structured. But still, you end up writing some kind of parser. You want to put it in your own data store, so you end up having some kind of schema <coughs> maintenance. And then you also have to do that for your own lab data. None of this is hard work. We all know how to do schemas and write parses. Some of us, like me, have specifically trained in people to do this kind of work. But it's all a little bit of work that costs money to do. And none of us are really paid for this. We're all scientists. We try to do new science. We're not really paid for parsers. There's no funding body that says, wow, you've written a really nice parser. They don't care about that. They want to know about, have you solved our disease problem yet? And then you say, well, no, because we had to upgrade, up, upgrade our Perl parser from 5.8 to 5.12, and that took two years. That is not what you know, the value added of our community is. That's a cost. In the RDF world, it's slightly different. 
because RDF has an embedded schema in it and has a standardized way of parsing it, even if there are multiple serializations of it, you no longer have to maintain your parser. You no longer have to maintain your schema. You still need to maintain your queries. So it's not that all knowledge, you know, work has disappeared. It's just one third of what we had before. <coughs> nice thing as well is that because triple stores have, you know, access over HTTP and you can talk between triple stores with the service keyword, is that you might not even need to maintain your data warehouse for other people's data. You can use the Uniprod one. You can use the Ensemble one. You don't need to bring it in-house. You can use it on demand. Also, when you're doing data integration, this is really nice because now you can first integrate it to figure out if it's worth integrating, just using service key, uh, queries. And then afterwards, once you've figured out, oh, this was worth integrating, then you pump it into highly optimized local storage. So the order of discovering if it was worth to do the integration is different. You still need to maintain your own lab data. That doesn't change. But that was the stuff you were paid to do. You weren't paid to do yet another parser for Uniprod. <coughs> That's my job, not your work. And it's a really hard job, to be honest. It's very difficult to parse Uniprod correctly. Well, you know, people ask, why are you using RDF and Sparkle? Why don't you use Neo4j, Titan, or some other very fancy graph database? And it's very simple. None of these have an ecosystem. They have commercial ecosystems. They have user ecosystems. But they don't have data ecosystems. There's no standardized way to pump data that would pump both data into Neo4j and in Titan and any other format. And then still, you end up with yet another small data warehouse. It's a graph data warehouse, but it's still a data warehouse. There's no connection between them. There's no federation. There's no federation on demand. It's always federation that can only be enabled by the sysadmins. And it means there's a lot of administration overhead. It means lots of things don't happen. Other thing is that's really nice about RDF, which in the beginning is a real pain point, but RDF forces you, when you want to do it decently, is to think about identity. What am I identifying? How do I make a stable identifier for what I'm actually talking about? For uh, the variant graphs, it's very much about this idea of how do I identify a <coughs> node consistently over multiple years in the variant graphs, even if I keep on adding information. RDF also forces us to be very precise about what we're actually talking about. And sometimes it's actually precision about we have no real clue about what we're talking, but it's about being honest about your data. And the last really big benefit is their standards. And that means there's lots of implementations. For Sparkle, there's more than 40 good implementations where you can choose out of. That means if you've gone for one Sparkle endpoint and you find out it doesn't perform for you, you can move to 39 other implementations which might have the functionality and features that you actually needed. We also found out for a very long time that document-centric REST is just not good enough. SwissPod has done REST since 1986. It started over email, but it had all the REST verbs. It was Yes, this was also email before email had the add symbol. So this has been a while, but it was an API that's been around. It was rendering for almost 15 years, and it was basically get accession number, which is basically what we do now with our HTTP gets. XPC, where we had the first SwissPod server, that's the first uh, life science server, uh, web server, 1993. <coughs> it was the second uh, web server where there was image maps. Uh, so it's really quite old, doing exactly the same thing. We have done REST for a long time. So we know it's not good enough because people still come to us and ask, you know, can we have a database dump? And you've been doing that for almost oh, 30 years now. We also, of course, realize most of our users don't use command line interfaces. But the people who build tools for our users, the developers, they use graphical user interfaces. They use, you know, MongoDB, MapReduce queries, or SQL queries, or Sparkle queries. This is the kind of user that we're looking for. And in practice, it's also what you're getting. You're getting a website with some examples, some documentation, some dates, some news, and a big wide field which says, go and type your query. And that can be a very difficult query. And it's a complicated data model. But that's because Uniprod is complicated. 
If you look at our database schemas, you will also go and cry and weep because there's more than 170 tables in them. And it takes a while to understand how all these things are connected. Or not longer connected, but used to be connected, but we didn't drop the table kind of things. <laughs> so that's quite true. We also have lots of people who actually do a lot of queries. And because we have a public server, it's not us doing the queries. It's you guys doing the queries. And it's just queries that are sent to us as little sparkle strings over HTTP. And we have different type of queries. And their differences are quite significant. Because depending on how people ask queries for different federated options, you can get one query or 30,000 queries. Because that depends on how other people implement it. So we don't always know how much work we are doing for somebody or how interesting a query we're actually answering is. We do just know that we are answering novel biological questions in collaboration with other people's Sparkle endpoints. And there's a large variety. We can have you know, months where we have millions and millions of queries, and other months where it's just two or three. The use cases that we really see is that some people ask really hard analytics, where it's basically statistics over species, even things like you know, uh, amino acid concentration, um, divergence over different strains in different bacteria, um, or we can find that they are asking for super specific information where they really ask, do we have a gene where we have a protein that encodes that, that is related to this other protein that we know that encodes that, and is there being shown an interaction between those two? So we know that some people ask really hard biological questions that would really be very difficult to answer on the website because it just means visiting about 80 pages, linking it all up in your notebook, and then drawing a schema yourself. The query works and often says we don't know because we still have, of course, the problem of our data. We also see that we actually have real people using it, and that's a growing number. Last time I did the slide was 301,000, and this is our estimate of worst case, best case. This is basically unique IPs, and this is unique user agents. So somewhere in between, we know this is the real number of people that use it. And you might say, well, Uniprod has 5 million users. You have, here you have 1,000. That's completely you know, a waste of money. Why did you spend so much money building this stuff? The actual users that we compare it to is the FTP side. And if you look at that FTP side, this is already one third of what the Uniprod FTP side gets as unique users. So this basically means that for one third of the FTP costs, all those people don't have to run their own data warehouses. They don't have to make their own parses. They don't have to maintain it. They always have up-to-date data. It's always up, well, it's within the day. So do you have, you know, a lot of benefit from it? And we also know these are real people and not robots because they take holidays. <laughs> and this was like, well, not just in August, also in December, you know, we see a nice drop in usage. And that basically means that the statistics are a bit valid. That's, you know, good. If your statistics, uh, user statistics says, well, everybody's using it all the time, they're lying. Um, <laughs> that means that uh, you have too many about, uh, robots. Well, in our institute, we have more <coughs> RDF databases, but uh, I'm also open for questions. And if you have questions specifically about other things that help at Uniprod, you can always send an email to help at Uniprod.org. But for now, I'm here to help and answer questions that I can. Okay, thank you very much.